There's been a pandemic. There've been protests. Sometimes it's hard to even remember what the world was like before now. And yet the gospel is still good news and heaven still rejoices over the number one. To make Jesus known, we each have to start with one lost person. Think about it. If I were to ask you who's your one, would you have an answer? I know it's hard. Your one might be someone hiding in plain sight. And sometimes, let me tell you about Jesus, just doesn't feel like the most natural way to have a conversation. But we're in this together. Tens of thousands of believers have found their one, and you can learn from them. Listen, everyone is talking about how the world has changed, but one person sharing Christ with one other person, that is real change. And it comes when you answer the question, who's your one? Well, good evening, everybody. I hope that you are doing well uh, and that uh, you and your family are staying safe and that everybody is staying uh, free from this virus and, and pandemic uh, that we're still struggling with. I want to let you know of a few things before we get started tonight uh, in our Bible study. First of all, this Friday evening at 6 p.m., we're going to have family movie night. This is for any of our families with children here at the church that want to just get out of the house and you don't want to go to the movie theater or anything like that just yet. Uh, but we're going to be showing the old Disney classic, The Apple Dumpling Gang. Uh, we'll be here at 6 p.m. in the Student Center Friday evening. We're just going to have a good time of fellowship and, and maybe we'll get to see the movie. Who knows? When you get a bunch of kids together, uh, there's not a whole lot of movie watching going on. Uh, this Sunday, uh, we will have available in the front lobby... Uh, some of our shoe boxes for the uh, Operation Christmas Child ministry. We do this every year uh, through Samaritan's Purse, uh, and uh, and our families just love it. I know my family loves to pack the shoe boxes, and so uh, we'll have some of those boxes available this Sunday in the front lobby. So if you want to go ahead and get a jump on that, grab some of those uh, and begin packing your shoe boxes. Uh, we'll uh, we'll have those in the front lobby this Sunday. Also, church family, make sure that you, uh, let me encourage you again to be joining us every day for prayer. Uh, we're sending out the daily prayer uh, emails uh, for our nation. We're doing 40 days of prayer. Uh, and then at noon every day, we have set uh, the, uh, the, the alert to go out through our app. Uh, notification, just a prayer update uh, through our app every uh, every day at noon. So uh, those are two opportunities for you uh, and for us to join together in prayer. Again, as I've been sharing with you, I feel like going forward, kind of out of this pandemic, that the Lord is really putting on my heart for our church to become focused on prayer, personal evangelism. And, uh, and so... Uh, be joining us in prayer every day as those emails and notifications go out, uh, and we want to we want to commit ourselves to prayer. This Sunday, we're looking forward to another great Sunday in God's house. Uh, we've got life groups on campus at 9 a.m. So if you have not yet joined a life group, let me challenge you to do that. We've got several that meet. Our college group is up and going. Uh, they had several in there with them this past Sunday, and I know they, they would love to have even more college students. So if you're a college student or you know a college student, send them uh, Sunday at 9 a.m. Uh, and then we've also got life groups for adults, for teenagers, for children, uh, and, uh, and we would love to have you on campus at 9 a.m., uh, but if you're not comfortable doing that, if you need an off-campus group, uh, off group or an online group, you can check out our website, taylorroad.org slash lifegroups, and you can find out which one you can be a part of. We want every person that comes to Taylor Road to be involved in a life group because that's where community relationships happen uh, and, uh, and where people stick. And so I want to invite you to that. We're looking forward again to another great Sunday this Sunday as we continue our series, uh, Fishers of Men. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 4, and so be praying about that. Who's your one? You know, we've been talking a lot about who's your one. Who is the one person that you need to invite to church this weekend? We've seen a lot of vis visitors. A lot of you have been bringing guests and people that don't have a church home. Invite somebody. Take some time to tonight or tomorrow, Friday. Text somebody. Call somebody. Shoot them an email. Invite them. If you know somebody that doesn't have a church home, that doesn't know Christ, call them, invite them. Uh, let them know about in, in our services and bring them with you. Uh, each one needs to reach one, uh, so to speak. We're all ministers of the gospel. And so bring somebody with you this weekend, invite somebody, uh, and we'll, we'll have a great time of worship this Sunday. Uh, let me start us with a word of prayer, and then we will dive right into the scripture tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time 
that we can come together online, Lord, and we can share in your word together. Father, we pray for our nation tonight. God, we are such a divided country, politically, racially, ideologically. Lord, there are so many forces uh, at work. Lord, a lot of our division, most of our division comes from, uh, from spiritual warfare. Lord, we pray, Father, that we as the church would have revival, that we would experience revival. And Lord, as we talked about this past Sunday, revival is going to happen when we confess and repent corporately and individually of our sin. Lord, so often we're, we're busy looking at uh, the, the people that oppose us politically or, uh, or ideologically, and we point our finger at them and their sin. But Lord, we, we've let our sin go unconfessed, unrepented of. We are your people. And so God, I pray that we would come to a place of brokenness and repentance over our own sin. Lord, revival also comes when we become a people of prayer and personal evangelism. God, put that on our hearts. Transform us and change us, God. Lord, we pray, Lord, as you send revival to the church, that that would then spread out into a great awakening in our country. God, our, our country needs an awakening. Much like this country ex has experienced throughout its history, Lord, we need another great awakening. Father, I pray, God, that you would just use Taylor Road, use us as individual members of this body to be salt and light in this dark world. God, we pray for the those who are in our church and in our community who are still suffering from this pandemic. God, we pray that you would bring an end to it soon, God. We pray, Father, that you would send a, a vaccine, Lord, that you would uh, just um, give those doctors and scientists knowledge, Father, and wisdom. Lord, that we would see an end to this, Father. Lord, we pray for those in our church family that uh, that uh, that are, are not coming back right now, Father, for whatever reason. Those that can't because of their age and their health issues, let, Lord, let them know we love them and that we still know that they're part of this body. God, we pray for those that may have fallen out of the habit of, of uh, corporate worship, Lord, and the practice of corporate worship. We pray that you would work in their hearts, God, to bring them back uh, into the body. Father, we, we just look for greater days, greater things uh, as we continue following you, making fishers of men, Lord, being fishers of men, Lord, as we do everything as a church, as a people, to the glory of God to introduce people to Jesus and teach them to follow him. And so, Lord, we, we commit this time to you. We thank you for this uh, opportunity that we have to come together over technology. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, listen, just as a reminder before we jump in here, if you have a prayer request as a part of our church family, let us know. Email us. Contact our church office. Let us know. Uh, we have staff meeting every week. We would love to pray for you and, and, uh, and minister to you however uh, we can. Uh, this weekend, this past weekend in church, our, our confession of faith uh, was, uh, was a continuation as we talk about God's justice and we talk about uh, God's uh, wrath against sin. Uh, and, uh, and so tonight, uh, we want to revisit our question from this Sunday. Uh, and so the question that we, we uh, considered this past Sunday uh, was this, is there any way to escape punishment and be brought back into God's favor? Is there any way to escape punishment and be brought back into God's favor? Again, this question builds off the, the, the previous ones. We're kind of moving through uh, in a logical sequence. And, and what, we, what we saw last week is that we are all lawbreakers. We have all broken God's law. We're all guilty. And as we talked about the Ten Commandments, we're all guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. We're all sinners and rebels against God. We are lawbreakers. And so uh, a breaking of the law requires justice. God is just. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that God's throne is built on a foundation of justice and righteousness. And so if God is just, right, justice must be served, right? There must be a, a satisfaction for justice. Uh, God can't, doesn't just sweep uh, injustice under the rug. God doesn't just sweep sin under the rug or throw it away and say, all right, you get to try again kind of thing. There has to be, if God is just and if God is righteous, he can't let sin go unpunished. Now, the question is, 
Who is the embodiment then of that punishment? Who is the recipient of that justice? And there's three options to, to, this, uh, to this question. Uh, who is the recipient of justice? If justice has to be served, if sin and unrighteousness, if God is holy, right? We believe that God is holy and God is righteous and God is just. Therefore, he is required by his self. God requires himself. His character demands it. His nature demands that unrighteousness and injustice and sin must be punished. Who is the recipient of that? Is it the lawbreaker? You would think logically, yes, the one that has broken the law must be the recipient of, uh, of the punishment for the law. But there is another option, and that's the story of the gospel. That's the good news. And so the question again, is there any way to escape the punishment that we so rightfully deserve and be brought back into God's favor? It's not just, listen, and then this is something that we miss so often. Everybody wants to get out of hell. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to go to hell. We want the punishment removed. But that is an incomplete gospel. Just having the punishment removed from us like not going to hell for all of eternity, that's, a, that's half of the gospel. That's incomplete. The whole gospel is that not just that, satis that justice can be satisfied and punishment can be removed, but that we are brought back into God's favor. We are brought into sonship or daughtership. We are brought into relationship with God. And unfortunately, that is a false gospel. There is a false gospel that many Christians in our culture in the South uh, have bought into. That if I say this prayer, if I do this thing, then I won't go to hell. And that's good enough for me. But that's, again, half the gospel. That's incomplete. It's not just escaping the wrath of God because you've said a prayer or you've gotten wet in a baptistry. It is being brought back into favor with God. We've talked about this multiple times on Sundays, especially when we were going through 1 John, that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, reconciles us to God and to each other. So salvation is more than just, I get to get out of hell. It's being brought back into favor with God. So what is this good news? What is this option? Well, yes, the answer to the question, is there any way to escape punishment and be brought back into God's favor? The answer to that is yes. And to satisfy his justice, God himself, out of mere mercy, reconciles us to himself and delivers us from sin and the punishment for sin by a redeemer. Just take that in for a moment. To satisfy his justice. God satisfies his own requirement for justice. We can't satisfy it because we're sinners. Because we, we can't satisfy it because, uh, because there, there, is, uh, there is no way to completely satisfy the wrath of God for sin. Yes, we are sinners. But the problem is sin. The problem of sin has to be atoned for. That's why in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says that God made him, Christ, who knew no sin, who was not a sinner, but he made him, who was not a sinner, to become sin. Notice what Paul doesn't say. Paul doesn't say that Christ on the cross became a sinner. Right? He was sinless, he was perfect, he was holy and justice, I mean just and righteous. And on the cross, God Himself in the person of Jesus didn't become a sinner. That wouldn't have satisfied God's wrath. He became sin. He became sin, the very embodiment of everything that's opposed to God the very embodiment of rebellion against God's holiness and glory and justice and righteousness. He became the unrighteousness. He became sin. That's so big. That's so huge. That's why Jesus is 
the satisfaction of God's justice. Not because he became, he, he was sinless uh, and was not a sinner, right? He became the embodiment of sin. The only way he could do that is because he was sinless. But you and I can't satisfy God's justice because we're sinners. Jesus became everything that God abhors, everything that God's wrath is poured out against, Jesus took upon himself. And as this confession says, he did it out of mere mercy. Mercy means that we don't get what we deserve. We deserve God's wrath. But Jesus himself took it upon himself. He delivers us from sin and from the punishment of, from, from our sin or for our sin by a redeemer. God's justice was satisfied on the cross because the perfect, sinless, righteous one became the embodiment of everything God's wrath is stored up against. And God poured out his wrath on his son. Our passage of scripture that we read here um, is out of Isaiah chapter 53. What a beautiful passage of scripture. And I want to read, we, we just focused this past Sunday on verses 10 and 11. But if you have your Bible, I want to I want to read kind of the bigger the bigger scope of this. Verse 3. If you have your Bible again, Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 3. Listen to what the, the this is the gospel. This is the good news for sinners like us. He, this is the Messiah. Again, this is this is hundreds of years before Jesus even came onto the scene. Okay? This is hundreds of years before Christ came to this earth. Okay, listen to what Isaiah writes. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Verse 4. Yet he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him as stricken struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities." Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mightiest spoil because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. This passage perfectly describes what many theologians have always called uh, the, the great exchange this is the substitutionary atonement. And this is such rich theology, such rich doctrine. The substitutionary atonement. There was a substitute in our place. One who could pay the price. One who could satisfy the wrath and justice of God. And atonement, that word atonement means the purging of sin, the cleansing of sin, the removal of guilt. And so a substitute, the only substitute who could satisfy the justice of God, the sinless, spotless, perfect, holy Son of God, 
was our substitute. He took our place. And he gave us atonement. He removed our guilt. He removed our sin from us by his blood. And one of the beautiful things about this passage in Isaiah 53, if you read this, it's interesting because this passage of scripture was written, again, centuries, hundreds of years before Jesus came to this earth before the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, took on bodily form in the person of Jesus, this passage was written hundreds of years before that. But if you paid attention, if you read this, it's interesting because this was all written in the past tense, right? He was despised, right? He, he knew what sickness was. He was like someone. He himself, he bore right? He carried. He was pierced. He was crushed. All of this is past tense, and it's past tense speaking of something that hasn't happened yet. Now, isn't this interesting? This is beautiful. This is great, because what it tells us is that God has always had a plan. God always had a plan to redeem us from sin, this wasn't something that Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, disobeyed God, and God began to scratch his head going, what do we do now? How do we fix this? In fact, the book of Revelation calls the Lamb of God, Jesus, the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. In eternity past, God had declared it. God had decreed it. He knew that we were going to sin. He knew the mess that we would be in. He knew the brokenness of this world. And in eternity past, God declared his son, the, the son of God, to be the substitutionary atoner, the atonement. I may have just made up a word atoner, but you see what I'm saying here? That in eternity past, God had declared Jesus as our substitute as the satisfaction for the wrath and justice that we deserved for our sin. This is a passage that not only speaks of his death, but also of his resurrection. Verse 12, actually 11, uh, by his knowledge, look at verse 11, my righteous servant will justify. That's justification. By knowing him, they will be justified. What a beautiful passage. I will give him the many as a portion. We are the bride of Christ. Because of his resurrection, our justification is sealed, right? And we become part of the bride of Christ. We become the inheritance of Christ, his portion. Man, what a beautiful passage. And so my prayer for us is, as we consider these things, we think about these things, we have to understand that this is more than just asking Jesus into my heart so I get out of hell. There had to be a price that was paid. There had to be a satisfaction for justice. And Christ Jesus is that for us, our Redeemer. And that should lead us to a place of gratitude. We should read this and consider this and say, what a Savior. Oh, what a Redeemer. What a what a beautiful, wonderful, matchless Savior who would do this for us so that we could be brought back into favor with God. What a great, great gospel. What a great God that we serve. Church family, think on these things. Take some time tonight to thank God in gratitude and live a life of gratitude, a response to his salvation and redemption that he's given us freely in Jesus.